Uh, our purpose this morning is uh, not just to obscure my socks, uh, but, uh, but we're going to do, a, in a few minutes, a panel uh, of discussion to follow up what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. Um, James chapter 3 talks about the tongue, talks about our, our speech, and we spent some time in James chapter 3 last week. And let me just make one other editorial comment about James 3. Uh, some have asked me about the Ravi Zacharias scandal, and, and um, it, that, that, that is horrendous, what the things that he uh, apparently engaged in. Um, but it's a reminder of James 3.1 that not many of you want to be teachers, for with that comes stricter judgment. And he will experience stricter judgment. For as one who spoke with authority on behalf of Christ and to have engaged a duplicitous life like that, um, it's just a reminder to us all. But we've been talking about speech and, and, uh, and how we engage and use our words. And I had mentioned that we wanted to talk about social media, and we're going to do that this morning. Um, understand that we, we can't explore the full realm of this. We're just sharing some observations, some principles. Um, and the things that James talks about and the passages we'll just run through in a moment are, uh, are, are things that certainly the scriptures speak to our words, that which we speak. But today, it's not just what we speak. It's what we say through social media. Let me give you an illustration. E Emerson Egridge, um, who many of you may be familiar with in his uh, book, Love and Respect, has written another book, and it's called Before You Hit Send. And in that, he, he has some wonderful principles and things to share, particularly about social media. And, and in that, he, he says he heard this back when he was a college student at Wheaton, uh, where a speaker said that Socrates had three guiding principles, questions that he used uh, we're not sure whether Socrates actually ori originated these or whether from somewhere else, we're not sure. But essentially this, he, he said, is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? And then Egeridge adds one for a fourth one. He says, is it clear? But as he opens this book, he shared some statistics, and I, I want to share them with you as well. Uh, they're from 2016, and, and so I can't imagine. You hear these numbers, try to imagine what it would have been like in 2020, okay? Every 24 hours, 205 billion emails are sent. That's 2016. Imagine what it was with people working from home last year. Every 60 seconds, 510 comments are posted on Facebook. 734,000 posts a day. That's just Facebook. Every second, 6,000 tweets across the Twitterverse. 350,000 a minute. 500 million tweets per day. I said, and that's five years old. And that's just Facebook and Twitter. That doesn't take into account Instagram, Snapchat. Well, remember, I'm a grandfather. I don't know them all. Okay? That, that's just a select group. Sampling. And so our, our focus is, is most of us in some way are using these platforms. Here's some guidelines for us 
for maybe how to do that. And, and I've divided it this way. I've called them proverbial principles and explicit expectations. Proverbial principles, are, I, I use that term because from the book of Proverbs, they're, they're, remember, Proverbs is a book of wisdom, wise sayings. They're not necessarily seen as imperatives, commands. They're just wisdom sayings, wise principles that God has given us. And so I, I just went through and selected some, some that we touched on last week, just, just to rehearse for us some of these proverbial principles. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 18. Rash words wound, wise words heal. The, those words that you fire back very quickly in response in email, maybe all in capital letters, or, or what you post immediately in response to somebody else. Those rash words end up wounding people. Chapter 12, verse 19 and 22, speaking the truth is a divine necessity. Lying, falsehood is an abomination to the Lord. We, 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 the principle is, hey, you need to speak the truth. And then chapter 15, verse 2, and chapter 16, verse 2, speaking the truth, though, should be seasoned with kindness to make it palatable. Just because it's true doesn't mean everybody wants to receive it the way you say it. And so how, how are we speaking the truth? We'll come back to that in a moment. Chapter 15, verse 23, words should be appropriate for the context. An apt word, fitly spoken. What's the context? Is it appropriate? Verse 28 of chapter 15, and this is uh, very much a, an emphasis in Egrich's book, think before you speak. Think before you post. Take a moment. And rather than responding immediately, step back and catch your breath and think for a minute. Chapter 16, verse 24, pleasant words have a positive effect. If you want to, to do that which is pleasing and have people respond in a pleasing way, use pleasant words. Chapter 17, verse 37, chapter 18, verses 2 to 4, restraint in words is wise while the fool speaks his mind. <laughs> Just using the platform to speak your mind. Uh, I have people who come and say, I want to give you a piece of my mind. And my internal response is, are you sure you can spare it? <laughs> Speaking your mind is not always the best thing to do. Chapter 18, verses 6 through 8. Foolish words, though, bring strife, personal ruin, your own personal reputation. Ask people who are applying for jobs these days or losing their jobs and slander. Those are principles that you see in the book of Proverbs. But when we turn over to the New Testament, Paul gets very explicit. These aren't just wise principles. These are the expectations that he places upon us as believers. This is how we should respond. This is how we should speak. This is what he expects of us. Just from Ephesians and Colossians, chapter 4, verse 5. 15, one that we hear often, speaking the truth in love. It's not an either-or proposition. It's a both-and. Speak the truth, but how do you speak it? Is it loving? And by the way, it's not just necessary to have loving speech, because sometimes loving speech can mask that which is true. Speak truth, not falsehood. Make sure that what you say, what you post, is indeed the truth. 
That's challenging these days. That ought to give you cause to make sure that what you post, <laughs> okay, in response or what you do, you've taken the time to really find out what it is. Verse 26, 27, anger in words can cross the line. Be angry and sin not, Paul had said. It can be sinful. And when they're sinful, they give the adversary an opening to wreak havoc. To wreak havoc in a church, to wreak havoc in a family, to wreak havoc between friends, wreak havoc for the cause of the gospel. Words. Speak words that are wholesome, good for edification, appropriate for the moment, and that give grace. You'll see something very similar in Colossians, Ephesians 4, 31, Colossians 3, 8, no place for bitterness, wrath, anger, or personal attacks. If your response is carrying with it bitterness, resentment, anger, personal slander, then you don't need to say it. Again, Colossians 3, 9, don't lie. Colossians 4, 5, who's your audience? The world is watching it and thus maintain a gospel witness. Paul says, look, may make sure you have a good reputation with those who are on the outside. We'll talk about audience in a minute. And then Colossians 4, 6, one of my favorites, season your words with grace, not poison. Season your words, he says. Let your words be seasoned, speech be seasoned as with grace. Make sure that the taste that people have of what you say is grace. Uh, having said that, now let me just give two other principles that I, as I thought through Facebook, one is called the principle of audience, the other is the, the principle of context. Um, because many times in social media, the way in which we communicate, the, these two principles get lost. Audience. Who are you writing to? Who are you writing for? Your audience is larger than you may think. Remember, it is the world wide web. And you may think you have a control over who reads your posts. Don't fool yourself. There are more people reading that than on your friends list. Again, ask people who have lost their jobs over that which they have posted. Or when they go to apply for a job and realize that their posts are costing them employment. They're larger, more diverse than you imagine. Not everybody out there thinks like you do. And the glory of the face of Christ may be marred in the heart of a faceless audience by words that betray his grace. Those who you cannot see, those who you may not know, who may be reading, you may be doing tremendous damage to the glory of the face of Christ. With that, the principle of context. Social media posts or tweets are sound bites that shout without a context. Tweets are 280 characters. How much context do you have? Context surrounding. Listen, context is necessary for interpretation. Often the reader has no sense of the purpose or the intended tone because there's no context to place it in. Even the assumption that all readers will understand it is mistaken. Having context is necessary to interpret. One of the fundamental rules of hermeneutics, and that's just not merely the science of interpretation of the Bible, it's the science of interpretation of any text. 
There's context. Without a context, it's a pretext. Well, we used to say many of those proof texts are really nothing more than spoof texts. Context is absolutely essential. And in those posts, people do not know. Other people reading that do not know the context. They may, not re they may read into it something very, very different in terms of the interpretation. Let me give you this illustration. And then while I'm giving it, uh, we're going to have a panel. Uh, this, this hour, we only have two, James and Chris Beck. Uh, the first hour and the next hour, we'll also have Keith Ray. Uh, Keith is teaching Sunday school this hour, so he, we've given him permission to go teach Sunday school. So James and Chris, why don't you come on up? But let me give you this illustration. Back at the end of, end of the year, the beginning of this year, there was a, a, an, a soccer player, English football player. He's actually Uruguayan. He plays for the, he's played for the Uruguayan national team. He has played for major teams across Europe. Currently, he plays for one of those teams, Manchester United. His name is Edison Cavani. Edison Cavani had a spectacular day in a game where he scored two goals. In response to that, his friends and others on his Instagram account began to congratulate him, send him messages. And at one point, he responded to one of, it, one of those posts and he used the term negrito. The English Football Association began an investigation into Edison Cavani because of the use of offensive language and speech over that particular word. Their conclusion was he was suspended for three games. He was fined 100,000 pounds, which is about $170,000, and he was sent to an education class. He was a little surprised because his friend was surprised because of how they understood it. A couple of weeks ago, uh, I, I have a kind of social media platform that the police, local police told me to be a member of called Nextdoor. And so up pops this message on Nextdoor, and I look at it, and I start to laugh. Somebody has posted this. They are rejoicing and so happy that El Negrito is back. Now, the lady is referring to her cat that she has named affectionately El Negrito. And, and the subsequent posts were, pray for Negrito because he's at the vet now. He had been missing for weeks. He's at the vet. The next one, praise God, Negrito is well. He's back home. And all the thread, everybody's rejoicing, happy, all the emojis, everything else. Come, and I'm looking at this and said, does this woman realize... Do all the people in the thread realize that a fellow in England was fined $170,000 for using that word? Context and audience. She was using it as a term of endearment or affection. The people didn't know. But for Edison Cavani, somebody in that universe was offended and took it completely wrong. The principle of context and audience. So James is up here because I have come to really value and appreciate James's insights uh, and uh, the things he has shared. Chris is an elder of the church and also because Chris deals with college students in coaching with AIA. Uh, we had Keith because Keith also is with Crew, and he heads up uh, some of the, the student high school ministries here in the Cincinnati area. And uh, Keith is a part of our church family and also our extended family. And so he had, again, the insights that these guys have were, were really helpful. So let me just ask a couple of questions for them to let them respond. And, and let me begin with 
the idea of the pitfalls. And, and realize that what we're talking about is it, it, not a just social media at large. It, it's, it's more how we use it, okay? Our involvement in it, okay? Rather than just looking at it as a blank slate. All right, so what, what are some of the pitfalls that you, you've seen in terms of the use of, of social media? Yep, you're first. <laughs> Great. I thought of the, I said this in the first service, but um, I thought a way to get rid of the pitfalls is to make your first hundred texts you have to use the old rotary phones, and that way no one would get through that and you'd get rid of the pitfalls. Um, I, I think for me the the things that I see in, in the athletic world is the first thing a coach or a um, an athletic department will ask a potential athlete or a coach that's going to work for them is give me your social media handles. Let me see your social media. And from that, what happens is they will do a background check. And we've seen coaches get fired. We've seen athletes not get scholarships. In fact, they've been asked to leave school because of something they've posted or something that they have a particular online presence on. Um, and it's, some of it is not because of something they've said, but it also is something they've liked. They've become part of, and if you will, they have signed their name as saying, I agree with that, and, or posted a picture of something that goes against the university's uh, policies. So one of the pitfalls is we create this uh, double life, who I am in person, but who I am online, or who I want to be online. And that, that is just not what God, God calls us to be. It is to be one person. So I need to avoid that pitfall in the stance of what do I like online? What is the presence I'm putting forth online? And is that Christ honoring? So I, I'm dealing with the physical side. I'll let James deal with the spiritual side because Keith <laughs> dealt with it the first time. No pressure. <laughs> uh, the, one of the pitfalls I see of social media is that it puts the attention on the individual in a heightened way. Uh, in social media, we are all the stars of our own show. Uh, it's all about us. And I don't know about you, but I don't need any help being selfish. I don't need any encouragement to be more selfish than I already am. And social media really does that. It, it, I mean, I honestly, and you made reference to this in first service a bit, I don't really care what you had for breakfast. I mean, I don't really care. If you want to post that you had waffles, I mean, great. But... It's just, it seems so, it seems just very self-focused on the individual again. And I don't need, I don't need that fed into my life. I don't need that encouragement. Another um, area is that uh, we're able to post and we're not looking at a person in the eyes. We're not carrying on a conversation with them. Um, anonymity breeds contempt. When we are not face-to-face -face with somebody, we will say things that we wouldn't normally say. Uh, we feel protected uh, because we're not right there. And that can lead to all sorts of things that we don't really want to, again, encourage in our own lives. I will share with you one of the things Keith shared in the first hour. He said, our tendency is to think that social media is neutral. And he said, it's not. It's not realize that the structure, that the whole structure of social media is a, world, is a world structure, a worldly structure. And so the natural flow, uh, uh, if you can imagine a river, is the flow of that river is being driven by the world. And when you jump in and are just figuring it's neutral and you get carried along, you end up behaving, acting, just being like the world in a place you don't want to be. So he said, it's, it's not avoided. He, he said, there, there's a way to realize that when you jump in, you, you've got to have your flippers on, you've got to have things, because you've got to swim upstream. You're constantly swimming upstream, and it's how easy it is for us to get carried away. But that's pitfalls. Again, realize that, that there, we could focus on the negatives, but what about, are, are there positives that, that are also it, that we can look at and say, yes, this, it can be a good thing, that upstream. <laughs> yeah, you're Looking first. at me again. Yeah. The glare. Yeah. I, the finger didn't come out, though, so. 
I, I think that there are positives, and I think God calls us to be salt and light in the earth, and this is one of the things that is a way that the world looks at. And I don't know that a theological debates need to be taking place on threads. Um, I don't know of anyone that's been convinced uh, of that. But if it is questions and answers, maybe you go to a private chat room. Or if there is um, debate, and I, I know this is way out there, but maybe say, hey, can I take you out to coffee instead of having this online? Can I, can I buy you a cup of coffee and we can talk about this? Um, I don't know, back in the day, your parents used to say, go have a conversation with them, because there wasn't internet. But I, I think that there are positives that I can relate truths of God to people. And I, I said this in the first service as well, is that I, I don't think we fully understand what the world is lacking. And w they don't know what they're lacking in the sense of all you have to say is I'm praying for you. And that gets a response. I have kids that call me and I pray with them over the phone. And they say, you know what? No one's ever prayed with me before or for me. And they come from Christian homes, supposedly. So I think we, we do ourselves and the Lord his favor by not speaking truth in love, but also just simple things. Like, how can I pray for you? Or posting that I'm praying for this person and this is going on. I think we, we do lose it in the fact of getting caught up in debates and, and things like that. We lose the simple truths of the gospel of grace. As a positive to social media, we have the opportunity to present the gospel at times or to, um, to be light in darkness. Sometimes just being kind is a form of the light because uh, so much social media interaction is negative these days. Um, and so, so, so when somebody's kind, like Proverbs says, a, a, a kind answer turns away wrath. So if we present that in a way it points people to seeing that there's something different. Maybe it opens the door to more conversation. But we do have the opportunity to share the gospel, to share truths online. And I agree with Chris. It's no place to um, have a lengthy theological debate. What was it? The Babylon Bee, great site, by the way, says um, they posted something that said, uh, yes, thousands come to Christ because of your Facebook post. Probably not. <laughs> Is probably not going to happen. So uh, that it's great to engage if we can be truthful and help share. But uh, uh, so that can't be a positive. Yeah, I have a friend in the south of France who's uh, ministering and reaching to Muslims in North Africa, but it's all done through social media. So there, there is a positive, uh, and there's a way to do it. Obviously, that that still shields and protects. Uh, those in very hostile areas. So, so there are positive, and again, to use the words that, that are winsome as opposed to that which drives away. Uh, so that may lead us to uh, any guidelines that you guys have, have employed or, or shared with others about the use of, of social media involvement? I think the guidelines that you gave were great. Uh, is it loving? Is it kind? Is it true? Um, another thing, <laughs> there's two things we talk about in our house, and that's that's what I, I'm, a, I'm definitely strong in my own opinion because I think it's right, right? That's what everyone gets in trouble with. Um, we tell our kids, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And even a fool seems wise when he keeps his mouth shut. So those are things for us is, you know, social media can be a good thing, but just because you can post it doesn't mean you should. Another guideline if we look at James 126 it says if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue uh, but deceives his heart this person's religion is worthless um, bridling our tongues is a significant part of godliness and we have to make sure that we're speaking as we've already said speaking the truth but doing it in a loving way not in a vindictive way not in a way to win an argument winning an argument does not necessarily win that person to Christ you win an argument, lose a friend, real easy. So it's not all about winning. Uh, it's about the person behind that. Um, it is hard to make the case that we're walking in the Spirit when we are texting in the gutter. So we need to be, again, considering the things that we're putting in print, that we're sharing with others. 
What does it say? What is our response? Yeah. Danielle and I were talking last night, and we did a little bit of quick research, and the generation, the zillennials, they've called like six to 26, that, that area, um, the average kid had a phone since they were 10 years old, a smartphone. So some of the stuff that we get mad at as adults and older adults, that they, why can't they just talk to someone? Well, we've created the problem. So we can't be very hard on them without teaching them how to interact, because it's a fairly new technology how to process information, how not to say something you're going to regret because it's going to be around you know, 20 years from now, whether it's on Snapchat or not. I know they're supposed to disappear. They don't. How do we teach them and mentor them how to use it properly as parents? The parenting always happens, right? Yes. One more. And uh, because our focus has been on the person who speaks to the person who posts, what about the person who reads? What I mean that is, I said, you don't know the audience. And all of a sudden, you've got somebody who's reading, and you're reading somebody's post, and you realize, whoa, uh, this, this has maybe crossed the line. This is, again, it's, this is not a question of whether you agree, disagree with the content of the truthfulness or not. Uh, you may still question that. But you're looking at tones and looking at words and, and saying, wait a minute. The, the, is this violating some of those explicit things? And as a reader, then, what's my responsibility? How do I deal with that? Because the tendency is then just to say, ignore it or whatever, or go away. But we're, we are responsible to help each other. Iron sharpening iron and, and, and helping, we live in a mutual community. How do we help each other? So what, what's the response of the reader? Do they have a responsibility? Here, I'll go first. Yeah. <laughs> Proverbs fifteen twenty eight says, The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. So taking a moment to maybe realize, well, how should I respond to this is good. And I, um, I find this very interesting. Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. In the next verse, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Now, sometimes we read that and we go, well, which one is it? What are we supposed to do? And there's not a contradiction between these two because I think both are things that you sometimes need to do. Sometimes you do need to answer a fool's folly so that he will not become wise in his own eyes, so that he will not think that he is all that. Uh, but sometimes we have to answer uh, the fool uh, in his, or we need to answer a fool according to his folly so that, um, uh, I'm getting myself confused, sorry. Not answer a fool according to his folly. Uh, we don't want to be wise in his own eyes. But sometimes we do answer according to that folly so that we don't, um, uh, we don't become like him ourselves. We, um, so maybe you could read those verses yourselves at home. It'll make more sense. <laughs> I've gotten myself all mixed up, and but then, it's good. And then put it out on Twitter. Right. <laughs> okay. Right. Chris? I'm confused. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. It's not hard to do to confuse me. I, I, we've all read posts where it, your blood starts boiling and you read it. And I think for me, I, ask that, I have to ask the question, is my anger my own or is it a righteous anger? Have they offended me because of... God? Like, it, are they offending God? Or are they just saying something that offends me? And honestly, God doesn't need you to defend him. Um, and that's the part I think we kind of get in the gray area if I have to defend God's honor. I've put God in a box at that point, and I, I don't need to do that, especially on that medium. Now, I go back to my original statement. If it's someone local, if it's someone that's a friend, I, I, I stop the online and say, Hey, can I take you out for coffee? I, when I read that, I, it just didn't make sense to me. Can we have a conversation about it? And most of the time, and I'm dealing with experience because of the guys I deal with with baseball, I, I cannot tell you how many arguments between boyfriends and girlfriends are started over text. Because you can't sense the other half of communication. And when they actually get them and convince them to call them, it's a misunderstanding more times than not. 
So using the basis of communication and good communication, not in so many texts and, and characters and stuff like that, is just have a conversation with people. And for me, it's just I, God doesn't need me to defend his honor. Yeah, the illustration I gave in the first hour was um, from my own experience, and that is I, I, if you're around me very long, you, you understand that I, I can be very sarcastic. Um, and not that sarcasm is bad. I mean, even the Apostle Paul uses sarcasm. Um, but there are times my sarcasm went beyond where it should have been. And a couple of years ago, I got called on it. And, uh, and, and I had to apologize to people for, for my sarcasm. Uh, and, and I know Rick Bush came to me and he said, Wayne, he said, I, 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 I don't know whether you're being sarcastic or whether you're telling me speaking the truth. I, I can't tell the difference anymore. And, uh, and I told Rick at that point, I said, you come to me at any point in time where I say something that you think I've crossed that line or getting close to that line. You have the freedom to come to me and tell me that helps me understand and grow. And I think that's, that's a little bit of, of, of the re response of the responsibility of the reader. If, if you read something and you're unsure, rather than letting it simmer and, and you know, go and talk to the person if you know them, as Chris said. Ask, can you help me understand this? Not, not again, to, to, to be in agreement, but at least to, to say, Does this, is this helpful? For, for what we're trying to accomplish here with regards to the gospel, with regards to our, our effectiveness in ministry, is it helpful? And have that conversation to get that clarity. You know, again, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Uh, iron sharpens iron. There, there's mutual benefit to that. So don't run away. Again, I, I agree with what you said. Make sure that it, you know, the offense part is really an offense and not just you being personal, okay, your personal preferences, okay? Um, let, let me just wrap up by, by, by doing this. Just, just some things for some practical guidance, maybe taking some of the things we, we've talked about. Um, take a social media Sabbath. Um, I, th this week was Ash Wednesday, and so we always think Ash Wednesday means Lent, you know, 40 days. I, we're not talking Lent. We're just saying take a Sabbath. Take seven days. Oh, off of social media. Uh, I'll tell you what was very helpful for me. It, it, it unveiled for me how controlling social media was. We're, we're uh, addicting. We're, we're to have that phone there and not have to pick it up and look at a Facebook or whatever. Try that. Take a Sabbath. In fact, not just one a year, maybe take three, three a year where you take a break just to help establish that sense of, wait a minute, who's in control of what? Uh, secondly, uh, make an abbreviated principles and an expectation list. Maybe it's only four points that we've talked about, Proverbs and, and, and uh, uh, Ephesians or some of the, the verses that James shared. And make, a short, make a short list that you can put next to your, whatever device or in the back that before you post something, you ask yourself those questions. And you think before you post. Ask yourself those questions. And then the last is have a friend do an audit for you. And I, a friend is not somebody in your echo chamber. Somebody you can be a little objective. Let them do an audit of your social media. And let, then listen to their feedback and make changes that you may need to make. And again, that may be something you do more than once a year. But allow a, a trusted friend to say, hey, I read these things and you know what? Mm, you've crossed the line. Having that audit and that accountability can be very helpful to avoid some of the pitfalls. Okay.